So good morning, everyone. Um, today we have Zoe Englander. Uh, she's a postdoc, uh, PhD, in the Defrate Musculoskeletal Bioengineering Lab at uh, Duke University. Um, so I was uh, fortunate enough to hear um, another uh, presenter in her lab earlier this year, um, and it just really spoke to me about what we can be doing postoperative for uh, ACL as far as considering different lengths and strains that the ACL undergoes during dynamic motions. Um, so we're going to have her present today and present basically the material that her lab's uh, been working on with ACLs. And then I'll be uh, talking after her and just kind of some of the implications that I've done, uh, particularly from a motor control uh, perspective uh, from her lab's work. So with that, uh, Zoe, you can take it away. All right. Thanks a lot for the uh, introduction and thanks for um, having me. This is Great. Um, okay, so the title of my talk is In Vivo Imaging Techniques for Understanding Non-Contact ACL Injury Mechanisms. Um, and this is sort of targeted to a pretty general audience because I wasn't sure what everyone's familiarity with different um, biomechanics research techniques might be. And so it, some of the slides might be, you know, pretty well known to you. Um, but just to begin, <laughs> The uh, ACL is a major ligament of the knee that's critical for the overall stability of the knee joint. Um, it is one of the most commonly injured structures in the musculoskeletal system. Um, it's estimated that over 400,000 ACL ruptures occur each year in the United States, 70% of which are non-contact. And that means that the ACL fully or partially ruptures without being subject to an external force other than impact with the ground. The incidence of injury is two to four times greater in females than in their male counterparts. <clears throat> the acute consequences of this injury include knee pain, knee instability, and lack of mobility. And in the long term, this injury often results in the early onset of osteoarthritis. And so after 10 years, more than half of all ACL injury patients demonstrate some evidence of OA. Uh, due to the severity of these injuries and its long-term consequences, um, biomechanics researchers have focused on understanding the risk factors and mechanisms of ACL injury using a variety of different techniques um, with the hope of developing maybe prevention programs that might prevent this injury from occurring in the first place. Um, there does remain controversy in the literature over how non-contact ACL injuries occur. Two theories that you may have heard of are that the ACL fails through valgus collapse, um, and this is where the knee collapses into knee abduction. And another theory um, that's common in the literature is that the ACL fails when an individual lands on an extended knee. And so in my experience with this topic, um, different methods of studying this problem have led to different conclusions. So I thought it would be beneficial to briefly review these methods and some of their um, potential limitations. So one method that has been used by researchers to understand high-risk biomechanics is marker-based motion capture. Um, and in this technique, markers are placed externally on bony landmarks and tracked using cameras. Um, force plates are used to obtain ground reaction forces, and this allows um, for researchers to get forces and moments at the joint, um, estimating them through inverse dynamics. Uh, one such study did a prospective analysis where they tested about 200 female athletes using motion capture, performing a drop landing task before and after their seasons of various sports. And this study found that the nine individuals of the 200 who did ultimately sustain an ACL injury during the season landed with a greater knee abduction moment than those who did not sustain an injury. Um, and the conclusions of the study were that increased knee abduction moment likely contributes to ACL rupture through a valgus collapse mechanism. So however, this technique has uh, several critical limitations that are really important to keep in mind when you're interpreting these results. First, it's assumed that the markers don't move relative to the underlying bone. Um, there have been studies using bone pins that have measured the skin motion artifacts and found that they can be up to um, the order of centimeters. <laughs> and that just means that the marker moves relative to the position of the bone. So furthermore, the lengths of the moment arms of the muscles and the centers of rotations of the joint are estimated um, based on sort of model anatomy and the forces and moments that are measured using motion capture are really sensitive to these parameters. So one study actually measured that knee flexion extension moments that are estimated during gait can vary up to 100% with only a 10 millimeter variation in the knee joint center of rotation. So there may be considerable errors in joint motions and muscle forces that are estimated using this technique. So another method that has been used to study how ACL injury occurs 
is uh, videographic analysis, and this is where joint angles are estimated by drawing lines on still frames of two-dimensional videos. Um, so using this technique, researchers have attempted to quantify the position of the knee at the time of injury. Um, so on this right panel, I wanted to call your attention to the player's leg that I highlighted by a red circle. Um, so the research identified that this player landed in a slight degree of valgus in that uh, row A um, at first, but several frames later, you see this dramatic valgus collapse of the, down there at the bottom. Um, the authors of the study classified this injury as a valgus collapse mechanism of injury based on this video. Um, this is another study, but using very similar techniques, they performed a video analysis of 23 athletes, um, 10 females and seven males who sustained an ACL injury and six female controls. Um, on the vertical axis of this uh, graph is knee abduction angle, which is also kind of um, referred to as valgus as well, um, valgus angle. And on the horizontal axis is the frame number of the video. Um, but I included the corresponding timing from the paper because it wasn't included on the original um, figure. And so the top data line that just looks like there's this very dramatic increase in the abduction angle is the ACL injured females. So again, these authors identified that the players landed at initial contact, so that's at zero milliseconds <laughs> with a small valgus angle. And then they showed this huge increase in valgus angle five frames later, and that corresponds to about 200 milliseconds. Um, so this paper has been cited widely to suggest that ACL injuries occur through a valgus collapse mechanism in females. So there are important limitations to this method as well. Um, in one of our studies from earlier last year, we demonstrated that the joint angles that are measured in a video analysis are really highly dependent on very subtle changes in the angle of the camera relative to the subject. So quantifying joint angles from still frames of two-dimensional videos can be extremely misleading. And also importantly, the timing of the injury is unclear from videos. So we don't really know when after initial contact the injury actually occurs. And it could be that the ACL has already ruptured by the time this large vagus collapse is observed. <laughs> so um, just briefly, another method that's used is cadaveric studies. And these are used to study um, ACL injury mechanisms by simulating the response of the joint to uh, some various simulated loading scenarios. Um, the issue, main issue with this is that it's very difficult to reproduce the complex muscle and ground reaction forces that are actually experienced during physiologic motion in a cadaver model. So for instance, if a research, what, researcher wanted to reproduce the response of a knee ligament to an impact landing, they would need to actually know the magnitude and timing of all of the muscle forces that are acting on the joint. And these are either estimated from motion capture experiments, which are pretty prone to error, as I mentioned previously, or applied somewhat arbitrarily. So while these techniques have provided a lot of valuable information on ACL injury mechanisms, one limitation that's common to all of these methods is that they don't allow for direct measurements of the function of the ACL or what's going on inside of the joint. So our lab has focused on the use of in vivo imaging techniques to allow us to make internal measurements of the joint's response to the in vivo loading environment. Um, and so in particular, our, one of our focuses has been understanding how non-contact ACL injuries occur. So in this uh, part of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on two different imaging methodologies that we've been utilizing in our lab to understand ACL injuries. Um, the first being the analysis of bone bruise patterns, and the second being our high-speed biplanar radiography imaging studies. So uh, starting with the bone bruise studies, the idea behind this is that bone bruises that are seen on MRIs after an ACL injury may represent the impact between the femur and the tibia that occurs around the time of the rupture. Um, these bone bruises are visible on MRIs due to bone marrow edemas, which result in increased water content, and this appears at higher signal intensity on T2-weighted MR images, um, and this is uh, highlighted in these yellow circles. So the objective of this study was to predict the position of the knee during the ACL injury by maximizing the overlap between the femoral and tibial bone bruises and then also to compare the predicted position of injury between males and females. Um, this is important because females uh, are more likely to sustain an ACL injury 
And some studies have actually suggested that females and males may sustain this injury through different mechanisms. Um, so in this was an IRB approved study, um, sagittal MRIs of 30 ACL injured subjects, 15 male and 15 female, were retrospectively reviewed. <laughs> and um, importantly, all the subjects MRIs were taken within one month of injury and the bone bruises are present on both the lateral and medial compartments. Um, so in order to do this analysis, the cortical bone and bone bruise surfaces were outlined um, on sagittal T2 images. Um, here, the outlines of the bone bruises are shown in blue. And then the tracings were combined to form a 3D model of the knee and the bone bruise surfaces. And then um, a 3D model of the femur was moved using an optimization algorithm, which, uh, which was developed by Sophia Kim of the reference Kim et al. that I've referenced throughout this section, um, in order to optimize the overlap of the bone bruise surfaces. So this is the predicted position of injury as determined by this method. Um, it's immediately apparent that the predicted position of injury involves a low flexion angle, so an extended knee, and a large anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. So the position of the knee at the time of injury was quantified in terms of flexion angle, valgus angle, internal uh, tibial rotation, and anterior tibial translation. So in this first graph, you can see that for both males and females, the male uh, being gray, the gray bar and females being red, the predicted position of injury involves a low flexion angle uh, or a straight knee. And also you can see that there was a large amount of anterior tibial translation, um, meaning that the tibia slid out in front of the femur at the time of the injury. And also uh, importantly, there were no differences found in any of these measures between males and females. And this suggests that the position of the knee is similar between males and females at the time of ACL injury. So um, to summarize, this study found that the predicted position of injury was similar between males and females, involved a straight knee at a low flexion angle, and involved a large amount of anterior tubo translation. So this study suggests that landing on an extended knee represents a high risk scenario, for non-contact ACL rupture, which occurs through anterior tibial translation for both males and females. And from this study, there was little evidence of a valgus collapse for either male or female. So another way that we have studied ACL injury mechanisms is using high-speed biplanar radiography to measure the in vivo function of the ACL. Oops, I was hoping this would play more than once, but it's not going to. <laughs> Um, so this example is a 3D reproduction of the motion of the knee joint, which includes the femur, the tibia, the ACL, and the cartilage as it bends that was um, created using a technique that we developed in our lab. So while we can't measure the ligament as it is actually being injured for obvious IRB reasons, um, the idea behind these studies is that if we identify motions that result in elongation and strain, in the ACL, we can identify high-risk knee positions and kinematics that might result in ACL injury. Um, and this is because um, intuitively, the ACL is likely to be more vulnerable to injury when it's under strain. So this is an example of one of our um, reproductions of knee motion during gait. And then we also um, did this for a single leg jump. And in this um, cartoon, the red portion is a representation of the position of the ACL during the jump. And this is actual data that um, I'm not going to show how we quantified it um, in a subject performing a single leg jump. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about how we actually do this, um, but essentially we create 3D joint models of the femur and tibia and the attachment site footprints of the ACL using MRI. And this is very similar sort of to how we outline the footprints of the bone bruises as well. Um, <clears throat> we do some calibration of the positioning of the radiography system, and then collect high-speed biplanar radiographs as the subject performs some motion. So as I just showed you, the jumping motion. Um, and then we register the 3D models of the biplanar radiograph, uh, 3D models to the biplanar radiographs using an automatic registration technique that we developed also in our lab. And then from, um, from this, we can make measurements of knee motion during the task, as well as ligament length from the models. 
um, ACL length is estimated by measuring the distance between the centers of the attachment site footprints for each knee position. Sorry, <laughs> that's me. That's mailman. Uh, the average strain response of the ligament can be estimated by normalizing the change in length to the length at the time of MR imaging um, when the knee is non-weight bearing and minim minimally loaded. Um, so I'm going to focus on our single leg jump study because this is the most relevant to these ACL injury mechanism questions. Um, so we made 3D models of the knee joint for eight healthy male subjects and then registered them to high speed biplanar radiographs captured during the single leg jump. Um, and we also obtained vertical ground reaction forces so that we could figure out important time points such as toe off, the initial contact with the ground, and the point where maximum ground reaction forces were reached after landing. And we normalized all the timing of all of our data for each subject between toe off and maximum ground reaction force. <clears throat> and then we measured flexion angle and ACL strain as a function of percentage of the jump. Um, the top graph is flexion angle on the vertical axis and percent of the jump on the horizontal axis. And the bottom graph is ACL strain as a function of percentage of the jump. So here I define 0% of the jump as toe off. And the point in time where maximum ground reaction force was reached is 100%. And in these graphs, I'm showing a few data points uh, prior to toe off. So um, as you can see from the top graph, subjects straighten their knees as they prepare to jump on the single leg. And you can see on the bottom graph that simultaneously ACL strain increased. So interestingly, the ACL strain remained elevated in flight even though the subject was in the air and the ground reaction force was zero. And then decreased as the subject flexed their knees after landing. So in general, we found that ACL strain increased as the knee became more straight. Um, and in this graph, you can see there's a clear inverse relationship between knee flexion angle and ACL strain throughout the jump. And this result is in line with several of our other in vivo studies of ACL function. Um, we did a similar thing um, uh, for treadmill gait, and we also saw that ACL length increases with decreasing flexion angle during gait, and also during quasi-static lunge. Um, so we can interpret these results in the context of the function of the ACL. So cadaver studies have shown that a primary function of the ACL is to prevent anterior tibial translation. And so, as I mentioned before, this is the tibia sliding out from under the femur. And the question is, what will cause the tibia to move in front of the femur, particularly when the ground reaction force is zero, such as in the mid-flight phase of a single-legged jump? Um, as you all know, the patellar tendon attaches to the rectus femoris, extends over the patella, and attaches to the tibia. So activation of the quadriceps muscles pulls on the patellar tendon and therefore also pulls on the tibia. And um, in this graph here, um, the red arrow represents quadriceps activation acting on the tibia through the patellar tendon. And in this image, the knee is straight or positioned in extension at a low flexion angle. And we can decompose this force vector into its normal component and shear component. And you can see that when the knee is straight, the patellar tendon is positioned such that the, there is an anteriorly directed shear component of force acting on the tibia through the patellar tendon. But on the other hand, when the knee is flexed, the shear component is posteriorly directed. So this suggests that quadriceps muscle activation is loading, loading and lengthening the ACL, um, when, particularly when the knee is extended. And this hypothesis has been supported by previous literature um, in, in cadaver studies and in vivo. Um, in the first study, they simulated quadriceps contraction and measured ACL strain using a strain transducer in cadaveric knees. Um, and they found that um, quadriceps contraction increased ACL strain when the knee was at a low flexion angle. Um, the second study applied a 4,500 Newton um, quadriceps simulated quadriceps force um, to extended cadaveric knees, and they showed that this was actually sufficient to cause an ACL to rupture. And finally, this last study um, measured the response of the ACL in vivo um, using an arthroscopically implanted strain transducer 
So these uh, participants were undergoing surgery, and so they actually had a strain transducer implanted inside of their ACL, which is not something that you can normally do um, in a normal research scenario. So um, that's why we need imaging. <laughs> uh, and so they also found that ACL strain increased as subjects extended their knees by flexing their quadriceps. So we hypothesize that the high ACL strain during the flight phase of the jump is related to quadriceps contraction when the knee is extended in the air. Um, and just as a, another note, this is a normal landing where um, obviously no injury has occurred, but this data does suggest that landing and extension can become dangerous if you have a change in landing strategy with unanticipated timing because the quadriceps are loading the ACL in the air and the taut ligament is more likely to fail. So together, our bone bruise and high speed radiography studies um, support the hypothesis that the ACL fails through anterior tubal translation when the knee is extended. And the anterior component of shear forces that are acting on the patellar tendon is um, relatively large. And so that this means that landing on an extended knee is a very high risk scenario for ACL injury. So I'm gonna leave you with this lovely video of a non-contact ACL injury. So if you look at the player in the middle of left leg, you see this large valgus collapse motion. But if you look closer, um, it appears that she's landing on an extended knee, and then the large valgus collapse occurs actually several frames later. So our data suggests that landing and extension is the main contributor to the mechanism of injury, um, and that the large valgus collapse is occurring after the ACL has already ruptured. And so that's all I have. Um, thanks for your attention. And I just wanted to acknowledge my wonderful lab um, in particular, Sophia Kim, who provided some slides for the bone bruise studies. She was involved with that. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Anyone have any? Let's see if anybody has anything. That was really informative, and I really appreciate how well you condensed that and relate it to kind of our field as PTs and ATs out there. So we've got one from uh, Dustin here. Uh, is ACL strain unrelated to ACL injury or loads that contribute to injury since the strain is highest in flight where injuries do not occur, question mark? Does that, um, yeah, so there's, it's multiple. Well, is that um, typed out somewhere so I can read it? Yeah, um, it's, uh, if you hit that chat down below. Chat, I'm sorry, I'm kind of a Zoom newbie. I, um, we use, I do not see it. Well, I'm sorry, I don't see it. <laughs> um, so, if it's easier for Dustin to ask it too. Um, and the, you could, um, I'm gonna actually, I'll see yeah, the screen it. there and it might pop up. I see it. Um, okay, is ACL strain unrelated to ACL injury or the loads that contribute to injury? Oh, it disappeared. Oh, did it, sorry. <laughs> I lost it. Oh, oh here it is. Okay. Um, does that create concern? If I if I understand correctly, um, so we weren't trying to uh, simulate. <laughs> we weren't trying to simulate um, enough strain. To, we weren't trying to create enough strain to create an injury. Um, if that's if I understand your question correctly, um, we were just we the goal of these studies is to identify knee kinematics that create strain in any you know at any magnitude um, because those are more likely to be the uh, kinematics that might result in ACL strain. Um, I mean, I think it's it's sort of an intuitive thought to think that. Um, if you have an ACL rupture, that it's likely to occur when the, when there is strain, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if that's 100% answering your question, but. If you... Sure, I, I could just ask uh, and not do the, yeah. the chat more directly. I was just wondering, is, is strain, um, how it's calculated, just that link deformation, is that not informative for an injury mechanism? Um, is it just better understanding ACL strain and isolation um, from this specific study, if you could comment 
more on that because a lot of the work um, that your lab's doing seems to be really focused at trying to better understand the mechanism. So I think that's that's sort of what I was uh, getting at with the question. Um, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. So um, in terms of how this relates to actual ACL mechanism is that um, by understanding the kinematics that create increased strain, that suggests that those kinematics are probably also involved in an ACL injury, if that makes sense. So it's an inference, yes, but um, I do think that this data is relevant to ACL injury because um, we've been working on understanding what motions put the ACL under strain. That makes sense. Gosh, that is helpful. I just have one more uh, follow-up. Yeah. Uh, so on the graph that you showed in that figure three, they're still in a knee extended position when strain peaks in flight and at initial contact. So they look like they're in the same relative knee flexion position. Why do you think the strain is so much higher in flight phase when they're not on the ground versus the initial contact when they're on the ground and the overall like load or force on the joint um, you would intuitively think is higher? So if we think that knee extension position contributes to the strain, why is the strain higher in flight when they're in the same knee position at initial contact as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So our hypothesis on that is that um, the quadriceps are what's loading the ACL during flight. So if you think about it, um, and this, um, the effect of quadriceps activation only has such a great effect when the knee is extended um, because of the kind of positioning of the patellar tendon. Um, so uh, our hypothesis in that regard is that when the subjects were in the air, they were, this is a pretty short single leg jump. So they're actually probably flexing quite a bit in anticipation of landing, potentially even, even more than when they've actually landed. And as soon as they land, most subjects started flexing their knees immediately. So that reduced the ACL strain, um, just again, because of the orientation of the patellar tendon. So that's okay. our, yeah. Thank you for your uh, presentation and the explanation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Great talk. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions about? Hey, Zoe, great talk. This is Mike Raymond. Um, so, so I know Bill Garrett always used to talk about, so are they, are they tearing their ACL in flight or with landing? Because he used to always talk about how they're kind of screwed before they land. But then how does that correlate with the bone bruise study from, does that, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yes, so we are not claiming that subjects tear their ACLs in the air. I think what we are saying is that you're, um, by having a straight knee and landing with your quadriceps contracted in anticipation of landing, and if you have some kind of weird um, misunderstanding of how you're going to land, um, that is what causes an ACL injury on an extended knee because you're sort of primed to injure yourself, if that makes sense. So I, we are not saying that we think the ACL is actually injured before landing, just that if there's some kind of change in landing strategy and you don't land how you think you're going to, um, and your ACL is taut because of how you landed, that's how ACL injuries occur, if that makes sense. And how this relates to the bone bruise studies is um, they actually uh, really well aligned um, using the two different methods because in our bone bruise study, we found that the position of injury, so how the, uh, the position of the knee at the time that the injury actually occurred, suggests that it was at, indeed at a very low flexion angle, so that makes sense. And also that um, this large anterior tubule translation occurs, which speaks to the, uh, when I was talking about the shear component being anteriorly directed, of course, acting on the patellar tendon. Um, so basically what we think happens is you're landing on an extended knee and then the ACL ruptures and the anterior component is very large. So your tibia slides out in front of your femur and then there's an impact between the femur and tibia resulting in those bone bruises. Um, yeah, so that's our hypothesis on ACL injury mechanism. Yeah, th thank you. And then probably the, the valgus is just a continuation of the motion. Yeah, so um, yeah, definitely. I mean, in, in those bone bruise studies, we did see that there was a very small five to eight degree increase in valgus angle at the time of injury as well, but it's just not large enough to be the main contributor and certainly not um, as large as what um, 
some of those videographic analysis studies have shown which basically they say, oh, you know, 200 milliseconds after landing, there's a 40 degree increase in valgus, and that's what causes the ACL injury. Um, but it doesn't, that doesn't line up with the timing of how um, it all should occur. And then also along with the inaccuracy of measuring 3D joint angles from a 2D video, um, that hypothesis doesn't seem to be completely Correct. <laughs> right. Thank you. Much more clear. Yeah. Of course. Great work. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or do you have Hi, uh, I'm Keith Kinner from University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks for this presentation. It was really interesting. I haven't been exposed really to this method before, so it was cool to see what you guys are doing. Yeah. I was curious, are you applying this method to other ligaments or tendons, um, specifically, I guess, of the knee, my thought would be to look at the patellar tendon to see if there's change in strain through that as well, or I, I don't know if you guys are doing anything else along those lines. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, we have looked at the patellar tendon using a very similar method, and we did this also during the single leg jump, um, with the idea being that if we see concurrent increased in increases in patellar tendon and ACL strain, that would be more directly linking the idea that the quadriceps are um, pulling on the patellar tendon and translating into ACL strain. And that paper is actually under review right now. So um, I didn't, I just didn't want to get too complicated with this presentation because I really didn't know what the audience was going to be like. But um, basically what we did show was that indeed there is um, concurrent patellar tendon and ACL strain when the knee is extended in the air, which really kind of gets at this hypothesis that um, it's quadriceps floating that is sort of priming the ACL for injury in, in a weird landing on extended knee context. Interesting. Awesome. Have you done any uh, testing with injured athletes or has everything been healthy? Um, so far, what we've done with the um, biplanar radiography studies is in healthy people um, with the high speed biplanar radiography studies, but we are going to be testing um, individuals who've undergone reconstruction or are ACL deficient um, going forward. We just wanted to make sure that we really understood um, sort of physiologic, basic um, dynamic ACL function to have a point of comparison first, but that's definitely something we're gonna go forward doing. Yeah, absolutely, that makes complete sense. And I, I think it'd be really interesting to see how things vary particularly with somebody who had a bone patellar tendon graft or something along those lines because that could definitely uh, impact the strain going through your patellar tendon. Yeah that's a really good point and that's something that we definitely were thinking about as well because certainly um, removing part of the patellar tendon will have other effects on the whole extension mechanism that are not accounted for but also um, we want to be able to evaluate sort of how well the reconstruction is um, mimicking the um, native function of the ACL as well. So there's a lot of really interesting things that we can do with that going forward. Great, thank you. Um, and I saw one more question on the chat now that I know how to do this um, from Alex. Uh, so is it safe to allow post-op ACLs to walk and should we less fearful of overstraining the graph with various exercises during rehab? So our data, basically the main thing that we can take away from that is that um, knee extension creates strain on the ACL when there's any kind of um, force involved. So I think walking, uh, we have a paper which showed ACL strain during walking. A lot of the stance phase occurs at a low flexion angle, whereas the um, swing phase, the knee is more flexed. So I think, and obviously I'm not a PT and so I can't make any like, real recommendations, but just based on our data, it seems that rehab exercises probably are safest when they are at a low, at a flex, on a flex knee, so, um, because that's when there's the least amount of um, strain on the graft. Um, but again, one of the things that I think that um, was really interesting from our jumping study was that, that you don't necessarily need to have a ground reaction force for that to occur. So it could be just, um, an, I guess, an open chain exercise um, on a flex knee is probably safe, but it could be there's um, also strain on the ACL, even though there's, you know, you're not actually in contact with the ground. 
on a in a low flexion angle scenario. Just to follow up with that really quickly, um, I'm a I'm a sports resident at the University of Delaware, so I'm fortunate to get the opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Lynn Schneider Macker, who's a huge uh, huge fan of a lot of your research. Yeah. Um, and from the kind of the basis to my question comes from, you know, your study showing that there's about a 13 percent strain on the graft with walking, right? And yeah. Some of the strain studies that we have um, based on various exercises show that even with large amounts of resistance in an open connect chain or even a closed connect chain squat, um, the strain is peaking around, you know, four to six percent. So, um, you know, that was kind of where, you know, if we look at those now and we compare, it's like, well, if we have someone walking um, and we're seeing strains up into 13 percent, you know, should we even be scared or fearful with some of these other exercises that aren't even putting close to that much strain on it? Oh, okay. But yeah, that's a really good question. So we get questions about this a lot, um, about the high strain scene and walking. Um, I should, what, so one of the things that's really important to take into account, account when you're interpreting the results from our studies is that um, the reference length has a big effect. So like what you compare the change in length to has an effect on um, the ultimate magnitude of the strain that you obtain. But um, the, so that definitely does play a role in the magnitude that you obtain. But I think what our studies are trying to get at is understanding the kinematics or so what the knee is doing when you see these peak strains, um, because that's actually more what is more um, informative in terms of um, what people should be doing and shouldn't be doing when they're in rehab if that makes sense. Because the actual magnitude, we're never gonna know what it is inside of a patient who's doing rehab, but we do know like what motions result in those increased strains, if that makes sense. So different methods and different studies, it's tough to compare between them in terms of the actual magnitude, but it's important to understand the kinematics that lead to those peak strains. That is helpful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Zoe, for all of that. Um, that was a great talk. I'm looking forward to kind of transitioning here and talking a little bit more on um, how I've taken some of uh, your work and tried to implement it in my rehabilitation programs here. So. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing it so myself. Can yeah. Absolutely. So. All right. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan. And uh, just like I said, we're just going to try to bridge the gap here. And uh, first, I just wanted to introduce kind of, uh, so if we're taking the, uh, the work done by the, the Freight Lab, and if we know that an increase in ACL strain is seen with that extended knee position, how can we uh, incorporate this, this entire rehab to hopefully reduce the risk of re-injury and influence our patients to move in such a way where they're preventing that elongated uh, strain position. So, uh, you know, the, the thought is if we just tell our uh, patients to keep their knee bent, they'll be able to do that and they'll go throughout their sports and uh, be able to do that and everybody will be happy just as they're seen in this picture here. It's, unfortunately though, it's uh, obviously not that simple. Um, so with that, I just want to introduce some of uh, motor control work that we can implement in our practice um, to be able to have individuals maybe more into those knee bent in those uh, co-contraction positions of the knee uh, versus that strong quad contraction as uh, Zoe talked about. Um, so I just wanna start off with a quote here that I got from a podcast that I listened to when I was uh, starting to explore kind of this motor control thought. And it's, I think it's just sums up what we're doing in ACL rehab pretty well. And that we ask an individual to look and focus on their knee for six months and then we ask them to go play sports and don't look at their knee whatsoever. And so I think the significance of this is seen both from a psychological perspective, um, where you're asking the individual to focus on their knee and think about their knee more than they ever have in their life. And then also at a biomechanical perspective, where they're in a motor control perspective, where they're focusing in on their knee um, and they're thinking of all those internal focus cues, but then when they return to the sport, they're not going to be able to focus on that knee because of the demands of their environments and all the surroundings and all the other things and inputs that they'll have to take into consideration through their motor control system and then be able to execute sports motions. So with that, I think we just need to start to briefly introduce um, some motor control 
um, cues that we can provide for individuals. And so I think what I wanted to limit this talk to, especially with our presentation time, is just an internal versus external feedback uh, cueing. So internal focus um, is typically, once again, gonna focus in on a body part. So the examples that we have here are land with your feet at shoulder width apart. Um, keep your knees over your toes. Land with a bent knee. Bend your hips and trunk. And I think myself as a physical therapist and athletic trainer, I'm guilty for cueing my individuals a lot in this. But when these individuals are gonna return back to sport, we can see how that gap isn't gonna be reached where they're still concretely thinking about that. And so that's why the emphasis has been more on an external focus and rehabilitation. And the thought with that is just that's gonna be more sport specific. So cues such as that is gonna be land on markers on the floor, point your knees towards the cones and touch the cones with your hands. It's important too that um, throughout the literature, it's been noted that there's an increased reliance on the visual system in individuals that are post-op ACL reconstruction versus individuals that are not. So what we need to do in rehab is make sure that we're really going in and regulating those proprioception, the somatosensory um, systems throughout the body to be able to go in and execute those motions without volitionally thinking of them because once again, those demands of the sport will not allow that athlete. Um, to be able to do that once they are returning to field. So it's something that, you know, the emphasis has to be on the objective measures of strength, but also at the same time, we need to make sure that we're considering these motor control and um, neuromuscular uh, conditions as we go about our rehabilitation. This is a great article that recently came out in February this year um, by uh, John Faltis, as well as uh, Dustin and one other author. Um, and it, I just thought this was a really great chart of, things that we can be just doing starting all the way from a simple short arc quad or quad set exercise. Typically uh, the cue is squeeze your quad muscle, lift your heel off the table, and we can just simply or, uh, transition that to an external cue strategy. Press your thigh down into the table and pull your toes towards your knees while following tempo. And this is gonna be following an external cue of that tempo, so they're also not focusing in from a psychological perspective on their injury. They're feeling more like an athlete. They have a target to do. They have a job to execute. And we can see how this might carry over a little bit more to the field and increase that uh, motor learning uh, response, essentially. And then we transition down even all the way at the bottom here to this plyometric variation. So jump and land without your knees going over your toes or collapsing inward and then jump and land while reaching for the cone here as well versus incorporating that into an external cueing strategy. So we can see kind of a ray from this chart of how we can implement that external feedback as an individual goes along in their rehab. So the first study I wanted to introduce um, to basically validate the notion that uh, feedback matters. Um, this study was out of the University of California and uh, basically they had an individual go through a single leg uh, drop landing before and after training. And so the training consisted of both a mixture of internal cueing and external cueing. Internal cueing be in, being increased the knee flexion of the hip and knee. Um, so that was the verbal cue that they gave them as part of training. And the external cue being land softly with some visual feedback um, as well through a video system. And uh, what you can see here is that there was a increase in that um, peak uh, knee flexion degrees as they went through that landing task. Um, There's also an increase in knee flexion excursion as well from the pre-testing the post-testing. So this study tells me that cueing does work, at least in the intermediate um, or direct um, response and uh, individuals can change their motor pattern readily from that. So what is the difference then between internal and external cueing? And I think this study in particular um, applies to the work of the DeFreight lab, where what they did is they weighed two groups. They had an internal focus group as well as an external focus group. And the external focus group, interestingly enough, that external focus wasn't even on knee flexion. It was simply push off the floor as hard as possible, where the internal cue was extend your knee as rapidly as possible. And this uh, task was done in a single leg hop for distance. I think it was about 10 trials of that cueing of pushing off the floor as hard as possible in the external focus group. And what was significant, I think, about this study is that they did show that there was no difference in distance, um, at least in a statistical significance perspective. 
So what you can see here though, from the results of the injured, so these people did have an ACL reconstruction. So that injured knee, you had a much greater knee flexion angle arc at initial contact in the external group, which I think is particularly interesting because once again, that external focus was not surrounding like a direct bend your knee more. Um, and, and they were able to bend their knee more. Um, and they actually had a picture of this. They, they pointed this out that the left here being typical of what they were seeing with this external focus group. And then the uh, right being that internal focus group with that stiff knee landing strategy. So simple, you know, it's pretty remarkable how impactful I think our verbal cueing can be in this. And I think this just correlates well to the work that the freight lab's doing. So what about retention? How long can these effects last? There's a few studies out there that I came across. This was a uh, nice systematic review in the Journal of Athletic Training. Um, it pointed to two studies that looked at retention. Uh, the first being uh, simply an external cue of reflect for two minutes of how to land softer. And so what they did is they brought those individuals, perform that same jumping task, and they did demonstrate a reduce in peak ground reaction force one week after training compared to the control groups. Um, and then the second group was verbal instructions and video of an expert model. Um, and in this, they produced smaller vertical ground reaction forces and greater knee angular displacement flexion angles one week after training across all groups. Um, it was significant in this that they didn't have that change in knee flexion, um, but they were seeing more of that knee flexion angle group as they went along here. And so then moving also into another study that looked at retention, this was a very interesting study and in the fact that it looked at a dropping landing test and then the uh, group was giving training uh, with an internal, external, or video focus. And then those individuals came back a week later and they're actually asked to perform a random 45 degree cut. So once again, a very sport specific motion. Um, and I think this is really well done study. And so what they demonstrated is that these individuals had a greater knee flexion range of motion compared to that internal focus group in that same exact cutting task as well. Um, and if you want to explore more of this, this was the podcast that I mentioned uh, with Dustin Grooms, as well as uh, Nicole Sertica. And I, I felt like I was this little boy on here just uh, joining them and listening and talking about more ways to implement uh, motor control strategies in my practice. Uh, so I highly recommend if you want to explore this topic more. And if you're a little uh, zoomed out or a little uh, tired of reading maybe some research articles, maybe a good weekend break. So these are some suggestions of verbal external cueing that I, I have implemented in my practice. Um, starting here on the left, is we're recruiting uh, lower extremity musculature to dampen the force during landing. Um, so some things just as landing as light as the feathers, shock absorber, land softly, minimize the sound that you make as you land, bring the ground slowly to you. And some things that I might implement if I had an individual landing with more of a um, torso collapse, if you will, having more of a, par a parallel torso position to the floor. I'm not sure about this first one. I do implement it often. It might be kind of a cheap way of getting out of keeping your chest up. I give them the cue of let me read your t-shirt the whole time, whatever is on your shirt, whether it's Duke or something else. For an alignment, I might tell them pretend that you're pass blocking where they're coming out of that three point stance. You're going to have to have an erect chunk right away. Basketball guard somebody who's about to shoot. Obviously you don't want to land with the torso. So maybe pretend or cue this individual that they were just faked out on a pump shot, they're coming down from landing, but they need to keep that torso up so they can keep their uh, hands in the air to potentially block a shot or at least obstruct the shooter's view as they're coming down. And then block a shot for a hawker, or a hockey, uh, a hawker, uh, so hockey and soccer goalie. Um, I grew up playing hockey, so I still call it a soccer goalie. No keepers in my vocabulary. Um, a hit modification might be, so I might give these cues for someone who is – uh, landing a little bit more preferentially through their knees and moving through a greater amount of knee flexion. Um, so reach out for the wall behind you. Uh, obviously the only thing that they can reach with is really their hips. Um, pretend that you're going to sit down and then pretend you're going to get going to go into a back pedal motion. Obviously the back pedal, you have to have an anterior displacement um, with that because you're going to be lying on those quadriceps a little bit more concentrically during a back pedal. So they might sit back a little bit more. And then moving on to having a hip frontal plane modification. Um, so if an individual is landing with a wide stance, tell them to just operate in a smaller stance or pretend, pretend, them, uh, pretend to tell them that two players are standing 
on your left and right and landing in that marker. So I think this would be useful in like a basketball athlete. Hey, you're coming down from a rebound and two guys are closing in on you. Um, just try to land a little bit more narrow. And then if an individual is landing in a very narrow stance, maybe tell them to prepare to move to the right or left. We know from the cutting literature that you need to have a little bit of a wider base of support with cutting to the right or left, um, as well as pre prepare to get hit, knocked. They might be landing with a wider base of support to give them some, a little bit more stability. So these are some ways that I would incorporate um, external cueing as far as uh, exercise suggestions. So there's numerous ways to do this. Um, a list and I, I think the coolest thing about incorporating these concepts is there's just so much variety in them and I think let's just put on our creativity hats here which I think physical therapists I've, I've found are typically strong and, um, and that's why individuals kind of get into this profession is they don't like things that are so black and white and that gray science so um, as mentioned here in the top right corner we obviously have some pictures here of an individual both landing in a target um, to control that frontal plane motion as well as touching the cone. So they might be landing into that knee flexion um, angle a little bit faster as well as um, foam rollers setting those up to touch the knee or uh, give some type of external cueing, just putting them on their long axis. And then using resistance bands or chains um, to also cue. I think resistance can be the most powerful external cue, especially if you are trying to target a specific muscle activation, but you don't want to tell somebody to squeeze your glutes um, I think resistance can do that, and it's that implicit um, cueing that we're going through. Lasers are uh, really good. I've read some uh, literature that mentions tying them to either the chest, the head, which is common in vestibular rehab nowadays, is to try to regulate neck control, but also maybe putting them on the knee and putting a target out in front and just having the knee maybe prevent some of that valgus collapse. Um, force stacks are incredibly useful for this as well, measuring ground reaction forces right and left. And having an individual be able to see on the screen, there's a lot of things coming out recueing that as well. And then also looking at balance systems as well. There's types of things like games like this, or you can just devise your own kind of on this low budget here with the soccer player, just trying to balance those uh, two um, thera uh, tubing kind of sticks to maybe prevent some shaking and just trying to cue in those and keep those easy. There's also auditory signals. So the verbal cue of a therapist or a coach to stop, go, as well as some feedback instruments as well. So I wanted to leave you with some of the exercises that I've utilized often when I'm trying to do this. So just integrating early um, isometrics are a safe thing that we can typically move for um, early in the rehab just as the individual starts walking. So what I'll do is take these Sorenex straps here, put that individual and then put a, put a straight bar or a hex bar underneath actually and, and fit it so that the individual is in a dorsiflexed, uh, knee flexed, and hip flexed position. And what they're gonna do is then just simply pull up to, into the band. So what I'm aiming for here is trying to re-educate the quadriceps to be most active in that knee flex position. So they'll preferentially move through that maybe when they're starting some jumping tasks and trying to get some carry over there. Once again, tying back to the freight lab work, just really trying to limit um, that extended knee position. Uh, video I have here is just doing a high, tempo squat so cueing this individual that as soon as she feels that bar behind her to just rapidly decline into that and go into that knee flex posture again and then you can also make this dynamic so providing a rapid move move in uh, where it's a little bit more dynamic a cue a little bit less anticipatory um, so just doing the same exercise here, but every time she feels a tap, she's supposed to go down as rapidly as she can, just trying to, once again, trigger that knee flex position, learning how to move there and try to limit that with carryover, but once again, an external focus coming in. And then we can even progress this all the way up to dynamic jump here. And just, great thing about this is it's over pressure, it's providing a perturbation, and just forcing her hopefully into that knee flex position a little bit faster. And then this is, I think, one of my favorite ones is just trying to use a monster band. Um, and I think it's important, and this is the challenge with using elastic resistance, it's different for everybody. It's different based on how long their leg is. It's different between how long their knee is, or I'm sorry, it's different based on how long um, their torso is. So what resistance for myself, who's 6'1", would be completely different for someone who might be shorter or taller than me. 
So I think it is a little bit of a shotgun approach of where you want to have enough resistance where you're maybe limiting that full extension, and um, but at the same time providing enough resistance where they're getting some uh, feedback from the band here. And so this is, I think, my favorite exercise from all of this and using the band. Um, so just integrating this with a squat jump. And you can see here in slow motion, as she extends, she's going to keep that knee flex posture. And I think that's because the band will pull her. This individual is very lax. And she does typically go into record bottom when she stands. Um, so that band is cueing her to keep that co-contraction of the quadriceps, hamstring there, and just teaching her that quad activation as she moves through. And I think if she extended any more, the band's just going to pull her into a hyperextension, which isn't going to feel any good. Um, it's important to note I didn't give her any cueing with this. It was just that implicit external cue, and she didn't know what this presentation was about or anything like that. Um, just trying to go through. So just briefly, some other ways. And I just wanted to give a note here that I'm not going to go through and just totally uh, not train full extension after this. I'm still going to have individuals vertically jump as high as they can. Um, I think it's important to regain total knee range of motion just for joint health um, when you think about loading of inert structures and surfaces, um, but also just restoration of that heel contact or great gait rocker motion as we just talked about as a group and all the peak forces and just preparing an individual to go about because they are going to get in those knee extended positions as any athlete is. We're just trying to really alter this and maybe, you know, a few degrees might make a difference in motor control and possibly preventing a uh, second ACL rupture. Um, and then I do have a focus though on continued cueing the prevention of knees locking out. That is something that I'm not going to allow my athletes when they're doing back squats to be able to lock out and rest five seconds in between reps. It's just something that I'm gonna limit. Um, and I think there can be implications as well as for anterior knee pain like this. Um, this is the last thing uh, I just wanted to show. This is myself. I tried to time this. Um, I wish I had a lot better motion capture software, but um, what I did here is put a monster band on. And the hard part about this is I know I was specifically not trying to think about what I was doing, but I probably was having a lot of internal focus. So I don't know how valid it is. Um, I would love to see a few studies just looking at, you know, possibly applying this intervention with the monster band, having individuals go through like a six week training session and then seeing what their knee landing as um, afterwards. So just some ideas of kind of combining the sciences as we go along. And then this is, uh, I think, a great exercise to implement as athletes get into high level. Sorry about that, I'm gonna kill the volume before we break everybody's um, eardrums. So uh, I think this, and let me slow it down because there's a quick video. But this individual goes, and he's going ahead and loading. He's in a little bit of a flex knee position here. And then I think this would be great to give him like an auditory cue to get down. And you can see how that elastic band is causing him to really push down and having that acceleration to occur more rapidly versus just the effect of gravity on this individual. And he's going to be landing in a little bit more of that knee flex position. I just think those hex bar, uh, and there's so many great things about that too, getting some uh, core activation um, and combine that with external cues can be verbal. Um, perhaps even transitioning that to like a single leg landing basing um, on, you know, if you have him out in front of you and you move the ball one way um, and him reacting to that. So just getting really creative with this stuff. These are uh, my references. There's a lot of great literature out there for individuals to digest. Thank you so much again to their Freight Lab. This is their Twitter. Highly recommend them following and uh, really thank them for their time today. And with that, just open it up for a uh, discussion from the group. Um, any questions in general that we can start with? Any thoughts? Um, if not, just a few exercise or, uh, questions to start our discussion there. Hey, Ryan, nice work. Um, when you're prescribing home exercise for um, motor control exercises, how do you go about dosing them? Do you go for volume to get the reps in or just so they don't get mentally fatigued with all the cues they're trying to do? Do you try to keep it low? Um, I think it, you know, depends. And I, I think Dustin talked about this in his podcast and I think it's such a great idea. Um, it depends on where they're at um, in their rehab. So maybe um, a little bit earlier going, um, you're going to obviously hit the physical fatigue with where the tissue is healing. So you might be able to then just dose some neuromuscular training after. I think um, Dustin talked about in his podcast, the study or 
some type of work. I'm not exactly sure if it was a study or not, um, where he had an individual basically fatigue out. So they weren't able to do any more um, shuttle press type exercises. And then they were supposed to visually close their eyes or it might have been a, 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 a virtual reality where they were then to practice 10 mental reps. And then maybe on the flip side of that, um, where you have an individual that's getting back to the sporting motions at high speed on the field, um, they're in a new environment. So maybe you're exposing them on the field first and then they're not physically fatigued, but you know, if you're tracking internal feedback or rating of perceived exertion and you're getting a spike with that, then you maybe bring them back into a familiar environment, a more controlled environment and fatigue them out physically from that. So that's how I go about volume. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I just wanted to say that this is all very different from, and I think it's really interesting for me to hear how uh, this all relates to our research and how this actually can affect, you know, athletes' performance and people recovering and stuff like that. And I thought, so thank you for, for this presentation. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it just had to do with your work. So I think uh, just hearing Lou speak, it was just really, you know, challenged me and, um, just happy to kind of integrate things together. Yeah, thank you. It's, I mean, very interesting. Um, so any thoughts on the exercises or how individuals might integrate that external cueing into your practice? Um, are individuals trying to prevent that early knee extension in any way? Any other novel ideas out there in the group? I had a question. Uh, it was inspired by something Mike Ryman said earlier in the discussion. This is, this is Lou, by the way. Um, he, he was talking about how Bill Garrett used to talk about, you know, you, you may be in trouble already before, before you land. So do you, do you think it's important to already be flexing in the air? And is there a way to train people to land that way? Yeah, and I think, I think that's getting back to that squat jump with the uh, external band. Um, so my thought with, like, the um, – the touch on the shoulders and the tempo squat, that would be, I think, earlier in rehab where somebody isn't cleared to jump yet. But we're trying to get them to move through volitional speed. It's not going to be a speed that's nearly occurring as the jump and you're escaping gravity, essentially. Um, but that's why I really like the monster band with the jump because it's almost going to be a survival mechanism where people don't want to hyperextend their knees and have a monster band pulling them into further hyperextension. So I think preventatively from a motor control perspective, they're going to be producing more of a knee flex position. So I think that would be my best go-to to, you know, to your point of, you know, what your group is doing with, we're not exactly sure on it. You know, we know that the strain occurs in those more extended knee positions. So just kind of try to do that carte blanche, if you will, and prevent that throughout the jumping cycle, both during initial contact and when they're in the air. And I think that external band exercise accomplishes that. So that's my go-to. Cool, thank you very much and thanks for inviting us today. Yeah, thanks again for being here. I, I saw some chat stuff pop up here. Hey Ryan, that was my question. So if we have a flex knee in the air, are we sacrificing power and performance of not performing a full triple extension because I think a lot of times we might coach a certain way based on what we know about injury prevention and rehab but then once it gets to the performance side the coach is cued differently so what are your thoughts on that um yeah and I think that's why I want to put that one little caveat slide in here I didn't want you guys to think that I am just uh exclusively um doing these types of exercises. I think they're really important to develop motor control, but I think it's important to develop maximal power. And uh, how you develop maximal power is you extend your knees. You're operating through a full total range of motion, right? Um, so I think it's a mixture. I think it's, you're, you're trying to move the needle. We know, I think, you know, in my lifetime, I doubt we'll uh, be able to completely prevent ACL injuries. Um, because of that that trade-off and uh we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week in cutting but it is that trade-off of performance versus safe positioning motor control of the knee and so yeah i think you have to train both and hopefully uh, you're moving the needle where you know if you're sparing one acl injury on your team i 
you know, that's a takeaway and that's a win. I'm still training though into those maximal, like, Hey, this ball is maybe an inch out of your grasp and I want a maximal vert jump to uh, be able to go up there and get that. Um, so I think, you know, still doing hex bar squats with elastic bands, but still doing hex bar squats, jump squats with just resistance too. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, on that same point with uh, extension, um, I think you got to remember between the difference between takeoff and landing too. Takeoff, by all means, like there's no concern with going through triple extension. You're not going to tear your ACL on your takeoff. Um, it's always the landing that's the issue. And the other thing to think about, I think it's a little more complex than just saying, ooh, if I'm fully extended that's not the right thing if you land in a fully extended position but you're able to quickly move through that motion because you have good control like we i mean it's good to use that it's then you have that whole range to eccentrically control yourself versus landing um if you land kind of stiff in that knee extended position then yes that's a concern so i think there's more factors than just is it is my knee straight at landing? Do I want to keep it bent at landing? I think that could also be a problem because then you're limiting the the range of motion, the excursion you have to actually absorb and control that motion. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, like I said, the somewhere, I think the answer is going to be more in the middle of combining these concepts of maximal sports performance and then also just exposing them to the demands of uh, what their sport entails, which with all of the external stimuluses going on, they probably will land in the uh, extended position. So you need to train that as well. There's no way to prevent that. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that. I mean, just training the eccentric capacity of the knee extensor mechanism so that they're able to do or to absorb that force is big. And then being able, because if they can't get to that or if they can't absorb the forces like that, if they don't have the capacity to, then all the training you're doing doesn't matter anyways. Um, so that, I mean, that's just kind of your foundational stuff, but you gotta make sure we don't throw or get the cart before the horse. Yeah, absolutely. Ryan, great, great job on that. The one thing that, that had come up was the cue for uh, landing in that soft position. One of the things that I will use sometimes is, and this is an early cue, um, is to think about landing before you actually hit the external cue of focusing on something else. Um, just gonna unplug it. <laughs> and then the other thing that I, I wanted to throw in there, um, I, like I love all the stuff that you're, you're talking about with external cues and I think Dustin's work is so impressive and so uh, like helpful for where we need to go with ACL. And some of the stuff that we've incorporated also is um, like a decision-making component. So to randomize their, um, their task and not let them prepare for it as much. You know, if you're just doing repeated double leg jumps, external cues to get them doing it correctly, <laughs> um, but then randomize it. So maybe they land on the right leg, the left leg, or both legs so that they've got to learn um, that motor selection quickly like like the the one comment about landing um have being able to quickly eccentrically load if we randomize it that can help and then the other thing that we've been playing with is adding in some sort of cognitive component to it as well so uh while they're doing the jumping maybe asking them some some unrelated questions or having them perform a secondary task and getting into that idea of uh hicks principle where mm -hmm. In athletics, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the field. You know, this gets back to a lot of what Dustin talks about. They've got to be focusing on everything else that's going on. So why not in rehab incorporate some of that learning as well? And uh, and we've been finding really good success with, with those techniques. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm thinking I'm unmuted. Yeah. Um, you know, Meredith just asked that question of training other cognitive systems. Absolutely. Um, I just – Wanted to kind of hold the presentation to more of that external stuff, but there's there's so many to your point um, about other types of you know stimulations of the cognitive uh, roles and also just stressing visual versus 
auditory type signals, there's kind of the sky's the limit. And uh, if, like I said, I think creativity is an awesome part of, when you think more of, you know, resistance is applying to integrate strength, but also resistance to increase motor control, I think it kind of opens up a new avenue of thinking about things. But thank you, that I, I hear you on the reaction and the cognitive stuff that lets it become more automatic, it's helpful. All right, um, let me see, missed anything else in the chat. Any other big questions or ideas or thoughts, um, types of things that individuals are doing um, in rehab? Um, if not, I'll see you guys next week then. Thank you both. You guys did great. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is enjoyable for me too, so thanks. Yeah, thank you so much again for being on, and uh, go Duke. Yeah. <laughs> this is the last week that Vien's affiliated with Wake Forest, so had to send him off with that. <laughs> it's all right. I've done it a ton to you, whatever. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your attention. This is great. And, um, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for being on.